And I'm going to start us from the current slide. It's straight up too, so um, we are going to go ahead and get going. So recording's on. Welcome everyone to the second webinar of the 2019 IGNIS season. IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. This webinar series is brought to you by the Office of Educational Technology and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and my good friend Kelly Mewson from Clover Park Technical College. And you may remember Kelly as our opening presenter from last week, so welcome back Kelly and thanks for helping out. Thank you. Yeah. So our topic today is student engagement in the internet age and our presenter is William Jackson. A big thank you to William for joining us today to share his thoughts on student engagement. And we've switched web conferencing tools again this year, so we're going to get started with um, just a very brief overview of some tools in Zoom and a few other housekeeping items. And then I'm going to hand it off to Kelly to officially introduce William to you all. So the first thing on the list is to check your audio. Um, to do that, you may need to press the escape key to exit the full screen view and find the audio menu. The audio menu is along the bottom of your screen. And if you're experiencing any audio trouble or you don't have a headset or speakers, you can definitely call in by phone. And that number is 1-669-900. 6833 and then you enter the meeting ID 361-298-378 and then the pound sign and that will get you into the meeting by phone. Okay, please note that all of our webinars are live captioned and you can access those captions by clicking on the CC button in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen and those are already all set up and ready to go. So those should be um, live right now. Here are some Zoom links you might find helpful. Um, if you would like to use your keyboard and use shortcuts, um, I've set up some bit.ly links um, to, get, to get there easy. It will take you um, to a list of Zoom shortcuts. And that link is bit.ly slash Zoom with a capital Z shortcuts with a capital S. And then if you do need to access any of the Zoom help tools, you can get to the Zoom help center at bit.ly slash Zoom with a capital Z dash help with a capital H. And those, um, these links are all going into the chat, so don't feel like you need to scramble to write anything down. Okay, the participants panel is located near the top right of your screen, and you'll also find the chat panel near the bottom right of your screen. And if you're not seeing those, all you need to do is click on um, the word more in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen, and then um, you can click on participants or chat, and that will add them into your view. So please type your questions and comments into um, the Zoom group chat as we go, and um, be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu when you're sending those messages. And um, Kelly and I will help monitor the chat while um, William's presenting, and um, we'll have you ask questions um, as we go. Um, for a full screen view, if you do want to go back into full screen, um, there are some little expand arrows um, and the words enter full screen. Those are kind of um, to the middle top of where you're seeing the slides. And if you want to exit that view, like I mentioned earlier, um, just click on escape and it'll pop you back to being able to see um, some of the other tools and panels. Um, you will find the participant tools in the participant panel. So um, you can also raise your hand to ask a question in addition to putting your questions in the chat. And you can do that by clicking on the hand icon. And then when it's your turn to speak, um, all you have to do is click the microphone icon um, that's to the right of your name. Um, and that will mute and unmute your mic. And then to cut down on um, excess background noise, um, please do keep your mic muted when you're not speaking. And then um, if you want to give applause or thumbs up using emoticons, you'll find those um, by clicking on um, the more option in um, the participant panel. Okay, 
get one more slide. Um, just to let you know, um, this webinar is being recorded, as I mentioned at the beginning, and um, you'll be able to find the captioned recording link on the ATL blog, along with the full IGNIS schedule at um, bit.ly slash IGNIS 2019, all in caps, dash recordings with a capital R. And again, um, we'll get all of these into the chat so that they're just clickable for you. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly to officially introduce William. So Kelly, take it away. Uh, hello everybody and welcome. And uh, join me in, inter in welcoming uh, Dr. William Jackson. Uh, he has the kind of bio that tends to make me feel very inadequate, but uh, he has done some incredible stuff. William holds a bachelor's degree in Asian studies from Brigham Young University. He has a master's degree in humanities from Pennsylvania State University, one of my favorite schools, and uh, history in Syracuse University, and a PhD in history from Syracuse University where his research focused on a major religio-political schism within South Asian revivalist Islam and its impact on the making of modern India and Pakistan. Before his graduate studies, he worked as a South Asia analyst in the Washington, D.C. area. He has worked at several colleges and universities, developing curricula, building online programs, and teaching U.S. history, Western civilization, the history of the Middle East, Asian history, international relations, world history, South Asian religion and politics, historical methods, the history of Islamic terrorism, 19th century European imperialism, and religion in America. He is the author of multiple books and articles and is currently working on two monographs, A History of the Diobani, Barelvi, uh, Rivalry in Pakistan, and a history of the weeks leading up to the U.S. war in Afghanistan. Dr. Jackson has taught almost 100 classes online using Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, and D2L. Now, for some fun stuff, he once ran over a 59-day period from San Francisco to Colby, Kansas, exactly halfway across the continent. And bravo. Uh, he lived in South Africa when Nelson Mandela became president, and he may be the only person in the world that speaks this combination of languages, Tibetan, English, Polish, and Hindu Urdu. So again, join me in welcoming Dr. William Jackson. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and um, turn it over to you, William. Okay. And looking good. All right. All right, well, we've got gotcha. you. So a quick note right at the beginning. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I ever actually made this clear, but this presentation especially pertains to online teaching. And the principles in it, I hope, are very applicable in any sort of teaching in the internet age, but the focus is definitely online or hybrid teaching. So let me start out by boiling this entire presentation down into one question that you ask yourself. And here's the question. How can I take advantage of the fact that I'm not bound by a physical classroom? I think too often we consider online classes sort of obviously inferior to face-to-face -face classes. And that's totally understandable. In some ways, that inferiority is, is obviously true. Um, I mean, what, what can adequately replace the face-to-face -face learning experience? I admit this is difficult. It's a problem that many online professors tackle by trying to squeeze the brick and mortar classroom experience as far as is possible into an online setting, which is sort of futile because they're two very, very different environments. So the point I'm trying to make here and throughout this presentation is that while the classroom obviously has its advantages, most notably the face-to-face -face element, so does the online medium. There are things you can do in an online setting that you can't really do in a brick and mortar box. And that should be the focus when designing and teaching an online course. That's what will engage students. Rather than approaching the online teaching experience as an exercise in trying to overcome all of the limitations and weaknesses, of the online setting, 
as an obviously lesser experience when compared to that of the physical classroom, I say approach it as an opportunity. Approach it as an opportunity not to be limited by the physical classroom. Take advantage of the fact that you're teaching an online course. There are advantages. Use them. In other words, it's not a matter of overcoming the inherent drawbacks. It's a matter of taking full advantage of the opportunities of the internet age and the digital age. So how can I take advantage of the fact that I'm not bound by a physical classroom? That's the question we should be asking. And in my opinion, as educators, we've only barely begun taking full advantage of these opportunities. We are too stuck in the old brick and mortar paradigm. I love, in many ways, the brick and mortar paradigm. Don't get me wrong. But if we're going to teach online, we can't be stuck in that paradigm. So how can I take advantage of the fact that I'm not bound? Um, so I'm going to focus on five principles in this presentation. We'll see what we see. I, I promise no earth-shaking originality or anything like that. I'm, I simply would you know, relish the opportunity to share a few uh, potential insights that I've gained teaching online. So principle number one, let them see you. We are social creatures. Uh, relationships are important. Personal connections are important. Being able to picture in our mind's eye the people with whom we're communicating, this is important. Uh, too often, online courses rely on text and readings while the professor is nowhere to be found. I should know since I teach history, a discipline that is famous for its dreadful, super text heavy online courses. That's not to say that history isn't the best discipline out there, obviously it is. Just that historians, generally speaking, haven't yet turned out to be great digital gurus. I say, use the internet and digital media to be everywhere. Make the course yours. For example, one of the courses I teach is Modern Asian Civilizations. But rather than thinking of it as modern Asian civilizations, a modern Asian civilizations course, I should think of it as my modern Asian civilizations course, William Jackson's course. The students will engage with the course much better if they engage with me, the professor. Obviously, there's going to be a few of them that have built-in interest in the subject matter. But for many, the link between the material and them is me. It's you. It's the professor. So be everywhere. This isn't a course, like a template you swap your name into. And you know, too many online courses are just like that. They're templates you swap your name into. This is your course, not a course. This is your course. So be ubiquitous. So here are a few simple ways I tried to be really present in my online classes. First and foremost, and most obvious, I include a welcome video. Now you'll notice a few things about this video right off the bat. It's wobbly. That's how you know it was one of my early videos, one of the very first I made. And we'll talk about basic equipment in a second. But despite its amateur nature, it does engage. Students respond to it. They write me. They send me vid a video response often. A welcome video can be embedded, obviously, in the learning management system that you use, Canvas probably, Blackboard, D2L, whatever, Moodle. Or it can be sent as a link in an email. But there you are, that's the point. There you are making eye contact with each of your students one-on-one. -on -one. I'd encourage students in the video to respond in some way, maybe to a specific question, maybe you've set up an online forum. Uh, that's always worked pretty well for me. Uh, maybe in an email response so you can respond one-on-one. -on -one. But this gets things going and there's a face and it's moving and it's talking to them. The goal here should be for them to see your face, hear your voice, you know, feel welcome, see your enthusiasm, and take some sort of responsive action. You'll notice in this video too, I'm not at my desk. I'm not in a classroom. I took this video on a beach in California. It has meaning to me, which I explained to the students. Uh, we'll talk about the advantage of, set, of, of picking a setting, a setting that matters a little later. But for the purposes of this welcome video uh, bit here, students can get to know you in part by seeing you in a wide variety of settings that are meaningful to you as long as you communicate that meeting. So include a welcome video, film it somewhere interesting, challenge students to respond in some way. But don't stop there. Uh, lots of professors take the time to make welcome videos. That's great, probably already over and above the norm, which is sort of sad. But 
we can keep going. So let's keep taking advantage of our digital options. Why not include a video of you in every session? My online courses are typically broken up into 25 sessions. I want my students to see me in every single one. I mean, in the classroom, students see the professor in every session. The, se the professor doesn't skip out how on half the sessions or almost all the sessions and pop into the classroom once in a while. They're there all the time. And we can do that online. And we can even go one step beyond and, and shake up the setting. I'll talk about that in a second. So remember though, this isn't a course. This is my course. And students engage better with the material if they're engaging through somebody. So I try to include a video in every session. That means a video of me. Students need to see their professor, not some BBC clip or something. I mean, other videos, great also, but you, you need to be there. You need to be ubiquitous. Uh, one way I work these videos in, in my courses, is by creating what I call mini lectures. Each mini lecture is between, it's about seven, seven eight, nine minutes usually, some are as long as 15 minutes. I guess by the way that studies have shown that seven minutes is it's like the magic number. It's the magic time after which viewers tend to begin losing interest. I think this is based on like YouTube data, YouTube research, but anyway, seven minutes. If you can keep uh, your longer videos, uh, break them up into seven minute videos or, or keep your mini lectures down to seven minutes uh, per video, that's optimal, I guess. Anyway, each mini lecture for me, between seven and maybe 15 minutes, I usually place them there at the beginning of each session. So there I am, always in an interesting setting that is pertinent to the subject at hand. I'm lucky again because I teach history. All history may be dead, but all history does have a setting, and those settings are usually still here. So I can take advantage of the internet age by bringing that setting to my students by teaching them on location. So think about that for a second. In this example, I'm in the incredible city of Osh in Kyrgyzstan when I'm teaching my students about the origin of the Mughals. Mughal founder Babur was from Osh and he ruled here for a time. So I climbed up onto this awesome mountain in the middle of the city and shot the video. Students engage very well with this sort of thing because I'm there. It's not some BBC reporter or some documentarian, it's me, their actual professor who they know. That is engaging stuff. It's one of the gifts of the digital age to us educators. Hey, William. Yes. Before you go on to your next slide, we have a quick question in the chat from um, Don at Bellingham Tech, and um, they also have their e-learning lab um, open with lots of people there. Um, okay. She wants to know by session, do you mean module or lesson? I mean lesson. Lesson, okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry. No um, worries. <laughs> Yeah, if a module, like it depends how, I mean, modules can be obviously arranged however you want. A lot of people have weekly modules or whatever. I say every time there's a, a, a session, a lesson, a significant amount of material being presented, if you can, be there. That would be my advice. And teaching in a digital environment, there's no reason we can't be. And, and again, we'll talk more about setting in a second. But I say be there. Show your face, let them hear your voice be there. Um, we don't have, oops, we don't have time to watch an entire one of these mini lectures, but here's the beginning of a mini lecture I filmed in Hungary. Just a few years after succeeding his father, Genghis, as great Khan of the Mongol Empire, Ogadai Khan ordered his nephew, Prince Batu, to invade Europe. Now, Ogadai had already consolidated his power over Persia. He'd made Korea uh, a Mongol vassal. He'd taken down the Jin or Jurchen polity in North China, and he was then battling the Song, the Southern Song, down there in Southern China. But he set his eyes west. His goal was to conquer and create a Mongol dominion reaching all the way to the Great Sea, Great Sea being the Atlantic Ocean. Let that sink in for a second. The general he chose to lead the charge under Batu's authority was the veteran Subutai, possibly the greatest general in world history, certainly. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop it there. Um, I understand, I mean, first, first of all, I point out here, I like to use the zoom in map feature. When you start making videos, and again, I'll talk about some of the software in a second. 
uh, when you start making videos, obviously you, you're going to find the things that you like to use and your students will come to expect certain things and look forward to certain things in your videos. If you have more than a handful. Uh, I like to use the zoom in map feature. It works for history. Uh, my students have come to expect that you can see I like to throw in other images. I like to throw in text. I even have started throwing in some subtle sound effects just because I found it's more engaging. And I understand that not everyone teaches history, nor can everyone go to Kyrgyzstan or Hungary, but all of us can be creative enough to shake up the setting. If you're teaching, like my wife, she teaches social work and she teaches an intro to social work class among other classes. If you're teaching intro to social work, you might consider filming one session's clip in a park, another on the street outside of a hospital, another in a school hallway after hours, whatever. Uh, I've had to ask permission here and there. Obviously, you'll need to do that if you're going to film in some of these places. But I found people are usually very cooperative when they find out you're a professor filming for one of your classes. If you teach math or physics, the possibilities are endless, obviously. Pick, pick anything in the real world that demonstrates or exemplifies what you're teaching in that session or lesson and film somewhere you can see it outside of an airport or on a street next to a pool, uh, you know, under the night sky, if you, if you have the equipment, anywhere but your office. And if you must film in your office, use an image or two to at least shake things up a bit. It's just more engaging. So use mini lectures or some other type of video featuring you in every session, in every lesson. Uh, is my my point here. Can I interrupt, William? Yes, please. Well, there was a question asked in the chat room and a little bit of follow-up discussion oh, yeah, let's about hear. reusing these videos. Uh, someone had a slight faux pas in that a student met him in the hall and said, oh, you don't have bangs anymore. Uh, what's your advice on reusing those videos? Uh, that's never been an issue for me. I mean, I guess that's a personal preference thing. I, in some of my videos, I have long hair. In some of my videos, I have almost a buzz cut. Uh, my students are often, they often comment on the fact that in the last video, I had a beard and then I'm clean shaven. I, I mean, I guess if that, if that sort of thing bothers you, you'll have to stay consistent or <laughs> only use the videos where you're, in which you have, you have the same sort of uh, style or, or whatever as you, as you have at the, at the, in the present. For me, that hasn't been a, I don't care if they see me looking a little different. In fact, again, part of the purpose of them seeing you is to get to know you at least to a degree, because they will engage with the material better if they know you a little bit. And when they see you change up and, or someone comments on that or whatever, and you explain, that's a little personal detail that makes you more of a human and probably they will engage with the material just a little bit better. I mean, this seems like a, a tiny little thing, but the more human you can make yourself in an online environment, I say the better. So in this slide here, was there another question? Um, somebody asked what video to editing tool you use. I will get there, I promise. Okay. Give me, give me one sec. I'll, I'll, I'm going to, I'll tell you what, not that I, my videos are not pro or anything, but I have, uh, I have preferences when it comes to basic equipment and then software. And I'll, I'll share that in just a second. Um, if for whatever reason you can't get a video in there, at the very least, I say insert an audio clip, your own voice into every lesson, every session. I actually recently filmed a session on location in Kazakhstan for this lesson here, which I'll use, but I haven't edited it yet. So I, I, it's, not, it's not there yet. So for now, this particular session at least has my voice at the outset. So in my opinion, for purposes of engagement, no session should be without you. Your face, your voice, preferably in an engaging setting. This isn't a course. It's your course. That's how you engage in the digital world. Uh, so let's talk technical side of things just for a second. And again, I'm no expert. This, these are just things I've picked up over time. When you look at my original videos, I think they're a lot, a lot more amateur than they are now, a few years later. 
because I've been consistently filming. And so here, here, here are just some of the things that I do. Um, if you're going to teach an online class, I think it's important to know this stuff. It's it maybe even critical that either you know how to design and create online content or you have access to someone who knows how to design and create online content. Uh, it's the little things that make the difference here. Instead of holding your camera, snag a stabilizer so that your videos are smooth. Uh, these days, you may not even need a stabilizer. The Google Pixel 2 that is in my pocket right now, my phone, has a better built-in stabilizer feature than the actual affordable stabilizers that I was buying three years ago. Like, it's amazing. You can make great videos with not that much time investment these days if you're willing to just put in that initial effort. Uh, if you're filming outside, I would invest in a little clip-on mic so that you have an audio track that isn't shredded by wind noises. Then I'd sync it to your video. Uh, again, none of this is particularly difficult, I promise. Uh, none of it takes that much time. It's about that initial little effort. If you don't have the know-how, someone at your institution does have the know-how and can help you. Learn to use Camtasia. That's, that's, that's the software that I use. Or you can use iMovie if you have a Mac. I use Camtasia for Mac. Uh, it wasn't that difficult to learn. And my videos started out simple. And every time I made a video, I learned a new thing. And within a few months, I was, I think, making pretty decent videos. Uh, learn to use Audacity. It's a very basic and free uh, audio editor. Learn to use Photoshop or something like it. And these are just basic digital environment tools. And, you know, if you regularly teach online, these are skills that, you'll, that will always be super helpful and profitable. Always. Not knowing how to do these things is sort of like teaching in the classroom, but not knowing how to use a projector or a whiteboard. It does make a difference. This is your medium. So I would learn these basic things. Uh, again, you don't have to be an expert or professional, but I would have basic uh, uh, online and digital content creation skills. Anyway, let them see you, be a permeating presence, include a welcome video, film it somewhere interesting, challenge students to respond in some way, use mini lectures or some other type of video featuring you in every session or lesson. At the very least, insert an audio clip, your own voice, into every session. If necessary, Snag a couple items of equipment, obtain some of the know-how necessary to thrive in the digital world. And I don't think you'll ever regret that, especially if you regularly teach hybrid or online. You just won't. It, it's, it's the age we live in. Uh, here are just a, a few, uh, or a basic rule of thumb for creating an online course that's engaging. It seems super obvious, obviously. It, we might assume everyone knows this. Um, but it continues to plague the online education environment, and that is avoid too much text. Uh, so here I'm talking about two types of text. Number one, too much text in terms of presentation, and number two, too much text in terms of assignments. So let me, let me uh, clarify both of those. First, too much text in terms of presentation. So. How can you use images to spice up your course? Well, first, you can use Wikimedia Commons or some other royalty-free database to find images about just about anything. So we really don't have an excuse. And they've got attribution information there. Uh, it's a gold mine. It's there for the using. Uh, there's really no excuse to present to students a screen full of letters. Break up the blocks of text with images. And it's amazing how many courses are still 90% text or, or more. I like to make my own banners. This is, none of these are big things. This is just a simple thing. But I like to make my own banners in Photoshop. I think it kicks the engagement level up a notch when you go one step beyond simply inserting images to creating your own. So again, very simple example. Every single one of my sessions or lessons has a name. But rather than just relying on a text title, I went to Photoshop. I used images from Wikimedia Commons. I created my own banners. It takes a few minutes, but my pages on Canvas look much more inviting. And you can see, too, that I've created these little number images, one, two, three, got up to nine. Uh, 
that also engage better than plain text numbers. Again, teeny little things. But these little things make a huge difference when it comes to presentation and, and thus engagement. So you can see here just a few more examples. I, uh, I create my own banners, not just for every session, but you can see here also for assignment pages. Really any page that students might find themselves on, on my course, I, I create a banner for that page. Um, it's just more inviting and therefore more engaging. Along with banners at the top, I also have made these, this little progress bar that I'll place at the bottom. Uh, I made these in Photoshop too. I don't know how good they are, but I've had quite a few. It's surprising. I've had quite a few students tell me independently that they really like this dang pr progress bar. I don't know what it is, but they like it. It's, some, it's like a visual affirmation that they're making progress and they like it. Uh, really simple. Uh, but little touches like this can make a big difference. And once you make some of these, once you make, you know, graphical numbers or a progress bar or something like that, you can use that again and again across courses. And here are just a few more examples of my simple little progress bar and my numbers. So these, of course, I have 25 of the progress bar, different, different graphics. And these are just in a folder that I, I, I can pull these out for any course that I teach online. Um, in an online course, anytime you can avoid text by replacing it with an image, even if the image has text on it, or the image is a sort of graphical text, I say do it. It's hard enough to engage in an online course without having to deal with huge blocks of text or text when you could easily have uh, some sort of inviting graphic instead. Uh, let me say quickly too, something about avoiding too much text in terms of assignment. So I'm not saying you can't assign readings. Uh, I'm a historian, I would never say that. Uh, a certain amount of reading, a certain level of reading comprehension is to be expected at the college level, obviously. I myself love great essays, great books. I'd hate to deprive students of all those things. But in an online course, think about it. In an online course, students tend to get reading in a session or a lesson, followed by reading for homework. It's a lot of reading and not a lot of engagement with the professor. Assign readings, but also assign participation in online forums, video postings, including videos with you in every session, podcast episodes, including po uh, podcast episodes with your voice and other more interactive activities. One way or the other, students will get lots and lots of reading in any online course. Virtually all online courses, students are gonna read a lot. I'm just saying that this should be kept in mind when designing assessments and course related tech. In an online course, if you can teach it without text, you should probably do it because students are going to get a lot of text no matter what in virtually all online courses. So yeah, in an online environment, avoid too much text, both in terms of presentation and in terms of assignments. Make your course as graphical as you can. This is what the students have to work with, to interact with, uh, to engage with, so make it inviting. Blocks of text tend not to be inviting. Reading for the lesson, then reading for the homework, tends to burn students out, so avoid too much text. Uh, the third principle can be summed up in two words, break out. And this is sort of the, this could, even, this could be the overarching principle of the whole presentation here. Uh, in a way, this is our challenge. This is, this is another way of asking the question at the beginning. Instead of trying to cram the classroom experience into an internet environment, break out of the classroom so you can take advantage of the internet environment. There are a million ways we can accomplish this. And of course, the means that we choose will depend in part on our field and on the course topic, but everyone can apply this principle to one degree or another. I've touched a bit on how I've applied it in my courses, but let's look just a little further here. Um, I like to change up the settings. And that's one thing I've, I'd suggest trying to do. And here you gotta be creative, but uh, it can be done. And it really doesn't matter what the course is, whether it's history or whether it's math or whether it's something else, you can always change up the settings and keep it interesting, keep it engaging. Try not to film in the same place every time. If you can, try to film in a different place every time. I know that sounds like a lot of work, 
but uh, it's actually quite engaging when the professor's in a different place every time. And that is truly taking advantage of the internet age of the digital environment. That's something you can't do in a classroom, but you can do it online. So why not try it? Uh, uh, these skills, are, uh, sorry, these, uh, these videos here, they all come from videos that I made for assignments. So these aren't mini lectures. These aren't me talking about history. Uh, the top one is a question selection assignment. So I have students, their first assignment when it comes to writing historical essays is to select a question. And we talk about, you know, what's a good question, what's a bad question. Um, and then we go on from there, but they start with a question. And uh, I just happened to be in the California Redwoods one day and I thought, hey, why not provide a few pointers on selecting a question right here? And so I just broke out my camera and did it. And it got a really good response. So the next year I happened to be trekking this middle one here. I'm trekking in the Himalayas. So I went ahead and offered primary source advice for my students as one is apt to do in that setting. That's the second video talking about primary sources in the Himalayas. And then I was in, I happened to be in Japan visiting my in-laws and I was at this uh, abandoned shrine here. And so I thought, hey, I'm gonna give some rough draft advice. So I just, I broke out the camera and while I was in this engaging place, I, I made a rough draft video. I could have made all these in my office and maybe that would have been just as good, but I think it's more engaging for my students when I change the setting as much as possible. It also lets them learn a little bit more about me. Again, that is also engaging. It's one of the things we rarely think about when we're teaching these online courses. And yet, think about your experience in, in the classroom. Your students do actually get to know you pretty well. So you've gotta be sort of a little more creative when it comes to the online environment in order to get them to know you. And luckily, the digital media gives us the opportunity. It's, it's an opportunity for us to uh, have our students get to know us in different ways. This is, this is an opportunity that is more difficult in the classroom. Um, remember, you are the conduit through which they learn this stuff. Uh, in an online environment, it's vital that the student gets to know you. So provide a setting, change it up regularly. I try to avoid even a single repeat in terms of place or setting in my courses. If you take a US history course for me, I want the student to expect the professor to be in a different pertinent place every session. Ecuador one day, New Mexico, New York the next, after that Virginia, then the professor's in London, then Florida, then Oregon, then Kansas. That's how I want it to be. And it's really engaging stuff. Some students, and I know this because I've been told on multiple occasions, they want to move on to the next lesson simply because they're curious about where I'm going to be next. They've come to expect that their professor is going to be in a different place. And it's interesting. Uh, so I've received a lot of good feedback. It's been very encouraging over this. Thank goodness, because it's a lot of work. Again, in history, I can't bring people back from the dead or transport students back in time, but I can bring them the setting. Then make it real by putting myself in that setting. That's one way. So that's one example, uh, one way to break out. And it works for me. I'm sure there are countless other things you could do and will do, things you think of teaching your respective courses in your respective fields that likewise epitomize the principle of breaking out. In fact, if you come up with a great idea, I'd love to hear it. I'd very much appreciate if you just drop me a line. I'd love to hear your ideas. So here's my email, just in case. Anyway, breakout. One way I've tried to do this, providing a setting, then changing up that setting constantly. That is one example. Find ways to break out and share what you discover. Let's start taking advantage of the internet age and the, the, uh, uh, the breaking of the limitations that, that are encapsulated in the physical classroom. Uh, if you haven't already, I would start collecting frequently asked questions and your written or recorded answers. It's easy to walk up to the professor after class or raise your hand during class to get an answer. And if you don't understand the answer, it's easy to say so in person and your professor will repeat it using different words or whatever. But the point is it's almost instantaneous. It's a, it's a process that happens within seconds or minutes. 
But in an online environment, sometimes it takes a flurry of emails back and forth over days or even weeks before the student or the professor gets it. This can be frustrating. So it's important in an online setting to have excellent, engaging, ready-made answers for your students available right from the get-go. As always, use videos when you can, supplemented by text and examples. Take screenshots of small excerpts of student papers, while protecting privacy, obviously, that provide both good and bad examples. Then explain in video why these are good or bad. Include help links, you know, help links to the Owl at Purdue or whatever. Have these accessible from day one on your site. It doesn't need to be some separate frequently asked question page, although that would be helpful too. These answers could and probably should be embedded in your assignment pages. You wanna make answers to frequently asked questions as accessible and available as possible in an online class. And you might ask, what does this have to do with student engagement? Well, actually, this has a lot to do with student engagement. Students may fall behind, students may drop out, and it's, of course, it's more common in an online course for such things to happen. Uh, students may give up in an online class precisely because something confuses them, they couldn't get a good answer right away, they don't feel like a back and forth by email or Canvas message or whatever. It just takes more work. But when you can reply with a help page that's clear, graphical, even includes video of yourself providing help and insight, that's engaging, that's rescuing. That's the sort of extra scaffolding that might be necessary in the online, non-face-to-face -face environment. So it's something worth considering. Include a, a frequently asked question page or embed answers throughout the course. Save your answers. Anytime you answer someone and this answer might be helpful to a future student, save it. Save the written answer, save the recorded answer. Embed them right in your course. Include that video content where possible. Uh, look for ways you can anticipate questions and provide answers before they're even asked. Um, the last principle I wanna focus on is this one. Again, pretty obvious, but I've noticed this is, again, something that sort of plagues online courses, uh, is that they're not engaging from the get-go. Often you have to swim through a bunch of tedious stuff before there is something engaging. Grab their attention immediately. I know we aren't in show business, but teaching an online course does require a certain level of engagement to really work. It's best to snag the student's attention right off the bat. Capture their interest at the very beginning of each session. And obviously there are many, many ways one could go about doing this. One thing I've done in the past is use headlines preferably very recent headlines. And of course, I'm teaching history, so this is gonna be different from course to course. Um, but for me, you know, I can pull a headline from a newspaper or a magazine. I can include a news clip that students can watch. And then we engage with the clip. What does it mean? Why is it important? How does this affect you? Is there something the reporter got wrong? Headlines, recent news clips tend to engage well because they're about things in the here and now. They're real, at least they're supposed to be. Uh, you go on with your class session after that. You go on with the lesson, which has something to do with the clip, obviously, before at the end doubling back to revisit the clip, which post-lesson is now imbued with new meaning. So one option that I've had success with in, in teaching history is open with headlines. They take, the subject manner, uh, they take the subject matter out of the theoretical realm and into the practical one. And regardless of the field in which you teach, there is a headline for you. Uh, you already know that I like to begin my sessions immediately with a video of me, the professor, at a new location. This session happens to deal with World War I. So I'm in Belgium. I'm talking about the German invasion and the ultra-propagandistic response of Germany's enemies. This video grabs students' attention, gets them in World War I mode. They can picture it in their minds. And when they're done, we are ready to dive in. They're ready. So this is how I do it. There are, of course, a million different ways you could do it. And depending on the course or the field, it'll be different. But grab their attention somehow, some way, right away. A couple other options. You could start your session with a personal story, a personal experience. And obviously, I'm not saying you need to you know, confess your sins or anything. Just share something that demonstrates the real world significance of whatever you're about to teach. Not only will students engage more once their brains are convinced they should, 
but they also get to know you a little more. And that's the definition of engagement, at least the type of engagement we're going for here. Uh, even just a compelling question can do the trick. In 2014, John Orlando pointed, pointed this, this out. He said, uh, I remember reading a, an essay he wrote. He asked the question, he says, how many classes start by saying, here's what we're gonna learn today, then breaking it down into segments before finally launching into the session. And obviously there's a practical purpose for that. It helps students organize in their brains what, what's gonna happen or whatever, but it isn't very engaging. In fact, Orlando points out that the people over at TED Talks actually explicitly forbid this. You are not allowed to start a TED Talk by saying, here's what we're gonna learn about today and breaking it down before launching into your main talk. It turns too many people off from the very beginning. It disengages right from the start. So instead, and watch a few TED Talks and you'll notice this, just watch a few TED Talks, the first like 20 seconds of a bunch of them and you'll see presenters always begin with some provocative statement or question. So this is just something to think about. Uh, the trick is to do this every session. And again, I know that's a little bit of work and I know that takes some creativity, but this is the sort of thing in some ways demanded by the digital environment. And once you've done it, it it's very engaging stuff. Make it a consistent part of your course. Um, I'm sure many of you already have ways and means of locking in your students' attention right at the beginning. Incorporate those into your online class. So let them see you. Avoid too much text. Break out of the classroom paradigm however you can. Include and embed frequently asked questions, rescuing questions. And in every session, grab their attention immediately. Regularly ask yourself, if you're teaching online, how can I take advantage of the fact that I'm not bound by a physical classroom? One day, I hope, we'll stop thinking of the online course as a default substandard educational experience. And instead, we'll see it as an incredible opportunity to take full advantage of the internet age in which we live. Thank you. Well, can I just be the first to say how fantastic that was? That was awesome. Um, I'm so in, I'm feeling so inspired. I'm not sure what locations I would use, but um, wow. Um, there are locations for you, I promise. I'm sure there are. I just need to figure out. Yeah, um, you just got to brainstorm. That's it. I know, right? You in one place, you will have a, you will have ideas for three more. I promise. Oh. And I also have to compliment you on your impeccable timing. You're ending just right on time, leaving us a few minutes for questions. <laughs> and um, on the subject of questions, we actually have two that we didn't get to while you were talking. So if okay. you don't mind, um, cool. those were in the chat and I'm gonna find those real quick. And um, we'll just, I'll just read those to you. Um, Michelle asks, how do you work with making sure your videos are captioned um, to maintain universal design and make sure everything's accessible? Well, YouTube, I, I put all my videos on YouTube because it's easy to, I can just insert the link right there in Canvas and I can, of course, toggle the sizes or whatever. And YouTube has a captioning feature where you can, lit first of all, YouTube will automatically caption everything you do. And obviously it's gonna be imperfect, but you can go in and edit their captioning. Uh, you, they, they have a little, uh, I'm trying to remember what it's called, beta studio or something. Anyone who has an account who uploads videos has access to this for free. And you just go in and you, you fix the captions so that they perfectly match what you're saying. It's all right there. Yep, so I, use, I use YouTube also. YouTube makes it easy, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it does make it easy. Okay, um, the next question um, was from Kimmy, and let me just find that. Um, Kimmy was asking, um, do you provide an intro in every video, like 10 to 15 seconds about where you're filming from, or do you just launch right into the course material? So for the mini lectures, it always zooms in starting from space to where I am. And then I have it written on, at the bottom of the screen, location, and then the place. If you're gonna take the time to change up the setting every session, then you want a little bit of a focus on that. You don't want that to be missed. And so I have it in big block letters, every single mini lecture, it'll say location, Budapest, Hungary, or location, you know, whatever, Jogja, Indonesia, or whatever. 
that highlights it because it's a consistency thing. They start to notice that after, after every session. And then I use a map as well. So yeah, I definitely point it out. If you're going to take the time and make the effort to change up your setting, point it out. Yeah. You and they probably the also get excited to look and see where you are. If you've exactly. set that expectation and it's consistent, they know you're going to tell them. So they're like, oh, I wonder where he's going to be this time. I can't tell you how often I get messages from students that aren't about the course. They're just asking me about that place or, or oh, I've been there and it starts a conversation. It's exactly the type of conversation you might have had in the classroom, but that is missing from a lot of online classrooms. So changing up settings. Uh, filming assignment videos in settings that have some meaning to you. Uh, these are start, these are conversation starters and it's engaging. I think you need to do this sort of thing in, in a digital medium. Awesome. Oh, we've got another comment um, from Karen and um, the comment is, I do want to remind us that instructors and students need to form a relationship in this students need to motivate themselves and also be motivated by what we provide. So what would you say um, about like students self motivating them themselves. Well, I mean, obviously that is very true. A lot of the students who are taking online classes probably shouldn't be taking online classes because they don't have the time management skills. They're not self motivated enough to, you know, without someone in front of them sort of uh, pushing them along all the time. And I do have, I have my own opinions about, I know there are some teachers that like to sort of go after every student, uh, you know, make this sort of uh, individual contact, make this this extra effort if, if they haven't heard from a student from, for a while, they'll, they'll sort of go after them. Um, I'm not sure if that's the best, maybe for some students, that's great. Uh, there is a level of expectation and responsibility that goes with taking an online class. One of the benefits of taking an online class is that it's, it, they tend to be a little more flexible. So students that are working or whatever, uh, or, or that have a particularly difficult schedules, they can work things around their schedule. So for certain students that have that sort of time management skill, online classes can be great. There are other students that take them because they think they're gonna be easy and maybe they need to learn in their first online experience that they're just as challenging as a classroom class. And that might mean that they might not do so well in, in, in their first online class experience. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing that we're to the, um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, um, but before I take the last couple of minutes to close us out, um, would you mind, because um, I'm, I'm sure we're all feeling a little bit in awe of your skill and what you've done. I know I am certainly. Um, could you maybe give us one pointer on where somebody who's never done something like this um, could start? Do you would you recommend starting with that welcome video? Oh, certainly. If, if, if you do nothing else from this whole thing, but add the welcome video, I'll consider it a success. If you don't have a welcome video now, but you add one, and particularly if it's not in your office, if you go film it somewhere else, I will consider this a success. Um, that alone makes a huge difference and is a conversation starter. You will get several students probably that respond to that right away. Um, that that welcome video that I posted in California, that was my that was the first video I ever made for a course. And it was spontaneous. I was there. It was beautiful. That beach had a certain meaning to me. And so I decided This is where I'm going to uh, create a welcome video for my courses and my students can sort of get to know me just a little bit. And I haven't changed it up because I the, the students have, it's been such a great response every time. Um, I think the key is to go make your first video. Don't start planning out everything yet. Just go make your first video somewhere, somewhere cool, somewhere interesting, somewhere engaging. And before you're done making that and editing that, you will have thought of three, three four, five new places, new ideas. Just get out there and get started. All right, that's awesome. Um, thank you so much. Um, that was really a fantastic presentation filled with 
just lots and lots of, of great tips. And I can't wait to think through how I might be able to incorporate that into my own personal teaching practice. Um, so thank you, William, for joining us and, and sharing with us. Lots of questions, uh, lots of comments going into the chat, thanking you for a great presentation. Um, at this point, it's just time to close out our webinar. And um, I'd like to invite everyone to return next Thursday, that's the 25th, where we'll have um, Mihaila Kasma from Lake Washington Technical Institute. Um, she will um, be talking about cognitive and effective in cultural competence. So tune in, um, same bat time, same bat channel. Next week, we'll just have a different presenter. And if you want to look on the ATL blog, um, you can find um, the full schedule. We will take a short break for a couple of weeks and then come back after the 25th. So um, that's what we've got coming up next week. And then um, if you have any questions about the Ignis content or um, contacting any of the presenters, please feel free to contact myself or Kelly. And here's our contact information. And um, it's been a pleasure having you here. And oops, we don't need to go to our, oh, I did have a post webinar chat question. Um, I was just curious how everyone heard about Ignis. So if you would take just one second and type that into the chat for me while um, I'm closing out, that would be fantastic. I totally forgot that I put that slide here. That's new from last week. I changed it up a little bit, even on myself. Um, and then um, again, thank you all so much. And the content um, for Ignis is licensed under Creative Commons CC by license. So feel free to um, reuse it at your own discretion. So thanks again. And um, thanks, Kelly, for co-hosting. And um, thanks to the audience and to William for being here today. And I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording now. And this will get posted um, to the ATL blog. And that information went in the chat. And it's also in the slides in the recording. So thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.